Tonight, we're counting down some amazing mistakes, madness and mayhem. I love a bit of biff. You don't see enough journalist biff. From macho misbehaviour... You need testosterone for that. Those guys who got big kahunas, you know, who do that. ...to cultural craziness. Only in America. There's multiple fractures and all sorts of chafing. We've got monumental mistakes. Crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah, it's completely insane. And masses of mayhem. It was probably a lot of... <laughs> Good evening and welcome to 20 to 1 Mistakes, Madness and Mayhem. Tonight we're counting down some of the most inane and insane acts you'll see committed by supposedly rational human beings. And we start the countdown with some lunatics who interpret the saying, go and take a running jump, too literally. Ready, set, go. Leaping in to number 20, it's an extreme sport that has committed fans, or fans that should be committed, base jumping. Can't you get a nice thrill from playing Scrabble or something? Why do you have to, why do you have to nearly die? There must be some better way of doing it than that. Yahtzee! We don't base jump because we've got a death wish. We base jump because we want to experience life in a slightly different angle. I am sink or swim, which one shall I choose? Yeah. That was definitely the most dangerous base jump I ever did. Base jumping is one of those things that is totally insane, absolutely unjustifiable, but I sort of admire them. I quite like people who just say, the hell with it. Ah! We are about to take flight, Designed as a life-saving device, the parachute is now, for some, life-enhancing, as base jumpers free-fall from ledges for as long as possible before opening their chute. So check it out now. Hey. People might think I do some stupid things, but you won't see me jumping off a bridge or bungee jumping or jumping out of a plane, parachuting. I feel so good inside. I'm like, juices are flowing. Feeling it, man. Yeah! That's what base jumping's all about right there. Feeling it, man. Woo! It's often illegal and sometimes fatal. In fact, it said the letters B-A-S-E stand for blood and stuff everywhere. If you want to do an extreme sport, be prepared to pay the extreme cost. I've never seen anything in such rapid freefall as those base jumpers until I saw the recent reputation of Seinfeld's Kramer. He was Seinfeld's funny, zany neighbour, but Michael Richards' racial attack on some hecklers at an L.A. comedy club was no laughing matter. Is he a stand-up comedian? I mean, oh, he's an actor. I know that. And he's a funny actor. So he's there doing stand-up, having not worked, and he digs himself in a hole. You can talk, you can talk, you can talk, you break up! Hold that mouth! He's a nigger! He's a nigger! He's a nigger! Oh, I'm sitting there watching that thing going, dude, just stop. Oh, my God. A nigger! Look at the nigger! Oh, oh no, you did it. Yeah, you did! Oh, no, you're in trouble now! Oh, no! Oblivious to being taped on a mobile phone camera, Kramer's moment of insanity kept going. This was like this psychopathic explosion. He just turned his axe murderer. <laughs> As a comedian, if you can't take a heckle, you should seriously consider that you might be in the wrong business. Three days later, Richards had to appear on national TV to explain his behaviour. I'm not a racist. That's what's so insane about this. I don't... And yet, it's said. It comes through. It fires out of me. What's with these people have these enormous tirades and then say, that's not what I think? Well, obviously, it is what you think, and sucko, you got caught. I don't like that sort of people, and I don't like that sort of behaviour. Well, you interrupted me, pal. That's what happens when you interrupt me right now. 
You need to take a good hard look at yourself, Michael. Tumbling into number 18 is the chance to be the big cheese for a year in the fine art of cheese rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling on a river. In one part of the English countryside, they aren't chasing foxes, they're chasing cheese. Eight pounds of rock-hard double Gloucester bounding down Cooper's Hill at about 30 miles an hour. Well, that is madness. You've got the cheese, you throw it, you run down, hurt yourself with a chance of winning back the cheese, but which is now covered in dirt. And then what happens to the cheese? Do you have a little, like, glass of wine at the end when you get down the bottom? Bickies? Why are we doing it? What's it well, symbolise? It used to be ancient fertility right? Stupid English custom. No one knows why it started or exactly when, but the English have been chasing the cheese for hundreds of years. Every year there's multiple fractures and all sorts of chafing and grazes, uh, but they continue to do it. How do you define madness? I mean, you know, some people say going down a ski slope is madness, but uh, this is what one could describe as a robust country pastime. Grinding and whining. Cheese rolling. Well, now the palms have lost the ashes. I suppose they have to be good at one sport. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Blasting into 17, it's space exploration and the mistakes we've made along the way. Fifty years after the first satellite was put into orbit, it's still not a perfect science. Rockets are really dangerous. You get this big metal, metal cylinder, you fill it full of explosive stuff, you light the wick, and if it hasn't gone bang within eight minutes, you've got your thing in orbit. In 2002, in the far north of Russia, space enthusiasts gathered to watch the launch of a 300-ton Soyuz rocket. Well, they were either nerds or they were journalists. Same thing. And they're all from different parts of the world, so you could hear a bit of Scots and you could hear an Italian. Just 29 seconds after liftoff, the engine of the unmanned rocket malfunctioned. I mean, they were going, oh, man, it's great, fantastic, yeah, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Shit. Oh. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God, it's just something blew up. Oh, my God, everybody's just gone to the ground. Extraordinary explosion, but... When you think there's half a billion dollars worth of equipment on that thing. Please tell me that didn't just happen. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, failure. A kilometre away from that, the shock was so intense it blew a window in and killed someone. These onlookers were luckier, even though they were closer to the crash site. Still to come on 20 to 1, mistakes, madness and mayhem. That looks like the most fun you can have with your clothes on. I love a bit of business. Let's go boom, boom on top of you. What's wrong? Just go into the side of his head. It was completely inappropriate and appalling. Just so high on my to-do list before I die. It was probably a lot of and not much else. Welcome back to 20 to 1, Mistakes, Madness and Mayhem. And roaring into number 16 is Mother Nature at her least maternal. Every year, hundreds of brave sailors face the cruel sea in the Sydney to Hobart yacht race. But in 2001, that cruelty took on a new shape. It looked like an atomic explosion, and its impact would probably be almost as devastating. Look at that. 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 Look at
looking at that incredible towering whirlwind moving towards them and sucking them towards it. I, I cannot imagine a worse nightmare. Two maxi yachts, race favourites, Wild Thing and Nicorette, tackled a twister up the New South Wales south coast and its 180 kilometre an hour winds. We kept on changing course and trying to outrun it, but um, it suddenly just turned. It got much bigger and it turned straight on us. It is hard to imagine and to see this thing just looming at you and what can you do? There is no out. You just have to say, we've got it coming. When it actually hit, you know, the sound was just incredible. It sounded like uh, millions of bees. Pursued and swallowed by the twister, Nicorette was tossed about like a toy. We got laid down flat one side. Didn't go right over the first time. I think the second time it went back, came up and went back over again. And that, that laid down a long way. At that point, I, it quite scared me. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. All thoughts of winning the race gone, survival in. But, you know, at 70 degrees, the boat's underwater. You're like locked in there with 10 other blokes. You'd be hugging and saying, see you later, mate. This is my time, I'm off. Amazingly, the boat and its crew were spat out in one piece. But Nicorette not only survived the eye of the storm, it raced on to Hobart with wet sails, finishing second. Afterwards, you know, they were going, oh, yeah, that's what happened, and this is what, hap what happened. I think when they were on the boat, there was probably a lot of... and not much else. Next up, a tribute to journalistic integrity, which on award nights can sometimes get a little bit blurred. Journalists have a reputation for speaking their mind, but at the prestigious Walkley Awards last night, one senior journo got physical with his opinions. You, you, you. Oh, I love a bit of biff. You don't see enough journalist biff. Well, it made an otherwise dreary night watchable. Oh, oh, yeah. High-profile columnist Glenn Milne had harboured a grudge with internet journalist Stephen Mayne for some time. The Walkley Awards, the Oscar night for Aussie journalists, is usually a sober affair. Here you have a room full of hard, hitting journos who have seen and done most things and they sat there with their eyes and their mouths wide open. I heard that you were talking shit and you didn't think that I would hear it. Journalists have big egos. They're very thin-skinned. They can dish it out and they can't take it. He has said some very, very unkind and often untrue things and I think that's one of the reasons why Glenn Milne was trying to uh, not only defend his reputation, but also the, the reputation of his wife. Now, I think we have a you, very... You! You! Following a media storm, Glenn saw things more clearly the next day. I want to apologise unreservedly to Stephen Mayne. Um, it was completely inappropriate and appalling. Um, uh, the only thing I'd say on my own behalf is that um, I took some heavy migraine medication before the ceremony. I shouldn't have mixed that with alcohol. Um, it was a brain explosion, and I apologise unreservedly. Migraine medication. <laughs> many, many, many migraine medications. I think we have a you, very... You! You! <laughs> you. <laughs> that's how, in his mind, that's what happened. <laughs> Wished into the countdown at number 14 is Spain's annual tomato throwing festival, La Tomatina. La Tomatina is an amazing food fight with tomatoes. That looks like the most fun you can have with your clothes on. I feel pretty tomato y, pretty emotional about this whole experience, you know? See, I like that one. That one appeals to me, where they just throw tomatoes at each other. This is no ordinary festival. What brings thousands of people to Bunol is not the chance to admire the floats or listen to music. 
Instead, they're right for action and ready for war. Oh, man, I'm feeling red. <laughs> Just go into the side of his head. That's the best fun you can ever have. How juvenile am I? <laughs> I think, you know, a food fight or a tomato fight with 30,000 people is just so high on my to-do list before I die. It's a tradition that's been around for only 60 years, but is now a firm favourite on the Spanish calendar. Every August, 100 tonnes of tomatoes are trucked into the tiny town of Buñol, just to be thrown away again, turning the streets into pasta sauce. Apparently it's um, dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and um, I thought, well, that's rather appropriate because that's the Bloody Mary without the vodka, isn't it? It's just tomato juice. <laughs> It's a waste of tomatoes. People in the world starving, these people just want to throw a few ton of tomatoes at each other. It takes just an hour for La Tomatina to run its course. Then the fire department arrives to give Bunyol and its residents a good wash. Gee, that guy on the Nappy Sand doorstop challenge, he'd have a lot of work. Hey, what about this? Why don't you wash all this, Mr. Nappy Sand? Better bring the big bucket. Rolling in to number 13, it's the deep ocean's biggest swells and the madmen who meet them head on. Can you imagine being slammed by one of those waves? No, thank you. Ready, steady, go! It's a death wish, you know, but, you know, they're amazingly courageous men. This fear of them the unknown becomes like something you absolutely have to confront because there is no way to turn back your decision. You catch the first wave and then if you get pummeled, then the, the, it sets three, the next two waves pummel you as well. And you just held down and you, and you can't breathe. You think of it, a box of water, fill it up one metre by one metre, weighs a tonne. Yeah, three foot. Fifty foot? How many tons of that? And if you get trapped underneath and it's going boom, boom on top of you. It is it. Those thoughts weren't in the mind of big wave surfer Pete Cabrinha as he conquered this 22 meter monster, the biggest ever surfed on camera. That is just lunacy. It's incredible what these guys do. That's like surfing a skyscraper, you know? They're like absolutely death-defying stuff. It's a boy thing. <laughs> you need testosterone for that. Up ahead on 20 to 1, mistakes, madness and mayhem. The bang! It was revolting. It must hurt. Crazy, crazy stuff. I don't know how you find out that you can do that. Some people would call that bulimia. You just know what's going to come. <laughs> Welcome back to 20 to 1, Mistakes, Madness and Mayhem. If you had a moment of madness and missed the start of the show, here's a quick look at our countdown so far. At number 20, they're just mad for base jumping. At 19, Kramer goes crazy. At number 18, chasing the cheddar. At 17, rocket science goes wrong. At number 16, the Sydney to Hobart story takes a twist. Number 15 is jousting journalists making the news. At number 14, a famous food fight. At number 13, it's a big wave goodbye to sanity. And at number 12, it's a performer whose act is really hard to swallow. For years, British entertainer Stevie Starr has been amazing audiences around the world with his unusual and unpalatable act. OK, we're going to suck the ball in the belly. Whoop! Boop! It is absolutely gross. And you always feel like the warning should be up. Do not try this at home. It has to be a hoax. It's got to be a ho the key padlock thing. Put the lock in my mouth. 
Where does he put those things? See that in there? How does he do that? Some people would call that bulimia. <laughs> I'm sure there's people out there, weird people out there, who regard this as an art form, but I'm sorry, I can't say it myself. Now we're going to put the sugar inside. Water. It's the whole, it's the whole vomiting it up thing. Here comes the sugar. It's coming up. Sure it is, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Please be joyful. I reckon it has to be sleight of hand. I don't see how he could swallow water and sugar and then not come out. Unless he's like a cow and he has four stomachs. Then it would be really handy if you could milk him as well. <laughs> Soaring into space with effortless grace, the daredevil divers gamble with their lives. Making a splash in the 11th spot, it's the cliff divers of Acapulco, thrilling tourists to Mexico since 1934. Two things I can't understand about these blokes. One is why you would do it in the first place. But secondly, why you do a dive where your head hits the water first. Must hurt. You know, entering the water from that height on your head, it's got to hurt. They probably have little necks. The divers must land when the wave is at its highest and also leap 27 feet outwards to avoid the rocks at the cliff base. Not only is it really tight, but you just hope to God that it wasn't shallow as well. And then you realise that it does get shallow as the, as the tide, sort of the waves go in and out. Crazy, crazy stuff. You've got to be mad to jump into, hopefully, three metres. But if you miss, bad luck, it's one metre. And you're dead or you're a quadriplegic. You've got to respect that, you know. Those guys who got big kahunas, you know, who do that, you know. And they're great divers as well. There's a real sensation of fear. It's like being on top of a big dipper. Then suddenly, ah, your stomach turns over. What about the Elvis bathers they wear too, the big Mario Milanos? These blokes have got these big sided sort of undie pajama sort of bathers. Yeah, it's uncool from start to finish. Well, Elvis did it famously in fun in Alcapulco, but um, uh, that was the skinny Elvis, the big Elvis. Well, mate, he'd need more than three metres and a bit more effort to get in those cozies. What to do with one 45-foot, 8-ton whale dead on arrival on the beach near Florence? That was the question posed to the people of a little town in the American state of Oregon, a question that turned them into a blubbering mess. It had been so long since a whale had washed up in Lane County, nobody could remember how to get rid of one. So dynamite it was, some 20 cases or a half ton of it. Well, I'm confident that it'll work. The only thing is we're not sure just exactly how much uh, explosives it'll take to disintegrate this thing so the scavengers, seagulls and crabs and whatnot can clean it up. And there's a guy like, you know, with a whole Acme, he's going to do one of those numbers. Just watching that footage, you just know what's going to come before it even happens. Like, honestly, I'm not an explosive expert, but even I knew that blowing up a whale is not the right thing to do. The sand dunes there were covered with spectators and land blubber newsmen, shortly to become land blubber newsmen, with the blast blasted blubber beyond all believable bounds. Then there's this great moment, or well, terrible moment, where the whale meat just goes bang. And then that realization that that's gonna come down. Don't wanna be an American idiot. The sound of that flubber bubba just, it was revolting. The biggest mammal in the world, this beautiful creature of the sea, just chunks of it falling out of the sky. The whole town must have smelt like Paris Hilton for weeks. A parked car over a quarter of a mile from the blast site was the target of one large chunk. The passenger compartment literally smashed. 
Myra, look at the car. You know, that guy is this. They're so surprised that there's this bit of whale on top of their car that luckily didn't hit a person. It might be concluded that should a whale ever wash ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. <laughs> only in America. There are more mistakes, madness and mayhem ahead on 20 to 1. I cannot work this guy out. But that's just nuts. Hey, look at me. He's just a pervert with a business card. I think it's such a great, a liberating thing. It's a great way of meeting people. Oh, it gives me goosebumps already. Oh, I'm not going to do it. No. But for everybody else, it's a beautiful thing. Welcome back to 20 to 1 Mistakes, Madness and Mayhem. And into the number nine spot comes an artist whose crazy creativity means he gets to see a lot of nude people. There's method in that madness. American artist Spencer Tunick travels the globe photographing mass groups of people posing nude. Nice work if you can get it. I cannot work this guy out. He's either a brilliant artist or a really smart pervert. I think that is art. That's as art as you can get, isn't it? He's just a pervert with a business card. Art or not, the real question is who would pose nude in public? Yeah, probably would. <laughs> no. No. What about the shrinkage? Not for me, for the boys. No. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, no. But for everybody else, it's a beautiful thing. It's not pornography, it's not lewd, it's forming a shape with living bodies. But what gets me are the people that are willing to strip off and lay on a cold sidewalk for what? Hello? Get a life. And what person wants to stare up a stranger's backside for three hours? I don't get that. That's art? Oh, please. I think it's such a great, a liberating thing, and I really understand people wanting to be part of that. And I've seen the pictures, and they're beautiful. I think most of us like to be nude, and we all enjoy an excuse and a reason to hang out nude with our friends and with strangers. I know I do. Tunic has shot public nudes on all seven continents, with the largest being 7,000 people simultaneously bearing all in Barcelona. 7,000? Yeah. Oh, that's a lot of cajones. Yeah. When he did it in Australia, she took him down to Melbourne, which is really strange. If I, if I was going to get my clothes off, you'd want to do it up in Brisbane, where it's nice and warm at least. At first reluctantly, but then more quickly, the deed was done and the participants took their places on the bridge. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience, really. And you're not worried about the cold? No, not really. And don't tell me that when you're lying there, no matter how small it is, next to the lovely lady, a bit of chat happens, we've seen each other with our clothes off, let's pop up and get a quick shandy. So it's a great way of meeting people. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> Hitting number eight with a thud, it's the tribal tradition of land diving on Vanuatu's Pentecost Island. Like a great many things like this, it didn't exactly begin with somebody looking for kicks. It is all to do with the maturing, the coming of age of young men on Pentecost Island, and this proves their manhood. Someone said to me, you've got to prove yourself as a man, can he jump off this tower with a bit of rope tied around your foot? I go, I don't know if that makes me a man, I think that might make me a little bit insane. It goes to show, though, that how things are different in so many different cultures. I mean, I think going out and getting drunk is probably the traditional way to celebrate your flight from, uh, from boyhood to, to manhood. That seems to be how they do it in most other places. This passage into manhood happens a lot earlier than our drinking age of 18. The kids aren't jumping off. Dad is actually picking the kid up who's hanging onto the bamboo. He's got to prise the fingers off and then throw this kid off this tower. 
But that's just nuts. Because the, the vine, this is what I love, the vine is too long. The idea is to hit the soft earth, which helps cushion the fall. Now, they're not totally stupid, though. They make sure they only do these jumps in the wet season, so the vines are elastic and stretchy, and they're not going to break their legs as they come down. I just can't imagine the kind of jolt that your bones would have. I don't go on rides at Luna Park because I can't quite manage the excitement of it. I can't get into the head of someone who would do that. Yeah, it's completely insane. Poor man's bungee jumping. You know, get a health and safety over there, quick. Jammed into seventh place, it's the instrument you play when you can't play an instrument. It's the frenzied madness of air guitar. It's being able to live the rock star dream vicariously without having to learn the instrument. I'm a singer, so I love air guitar. So I try and mimic my, my guitarist all the time. I play a little bit of air turntablism. Personally, I'm into the air drums. What, what's next? We're going to go to a concert where there's an entire band on stage with a guy just... That would be pretty boring to me. When the air kind of gets into your bloodstream, it's kind of an addiction. I mean, it's like a drug, you know, and, and it's intangible. It's something you can't understand until you've done it. Since the first organized contest in 1994, imitation instrumentalists have traveled, by air mostly, to air guitar championships all over the world. I once hosted the Australian Championships, and these guys went ballistic. It was hilarious, I mean, because they become very animated until they're stage diving. That's worth saying. Come on, crowd, get in the way! They devote their lives to trying to win those awards. They look like they're having some strange kind of fit when they're doing it. Well, I'm not very talented. I feel like this is the best way for me to show who I am and get some attention and some fame maybe without actually doing any work. Really sad. I think those people need to get lives. After the break on 20 to 1, mistakes, madness and mayhem. No amount of money would get me to do that. And he's not wearing anything. He's in a leotard. People will do anything for their 15 minutes of fame. Clearly, Spider-Man is a big thing for him. <laughs> They're a bit mad, aren't they? That's nothing. What is this guy on about? Two words. Extremely disturbing. Welcome back to 20 to 1. Mistakes, madness and mayhem. Counting down great moments of insanity. OK, bring in the bugs. Oh, my oh, God. God. Oh my god. Nice, cold, and dark in there. Enjoy it. Here we go. You wanted to be on TV? Here's your shot. At number six, it's the madness and mayhem people will endure just to be on TV. You know, being on television has become the be all and end all for a lot of people. They will humiliate themselves, they will behave in the most outrageous, anything as long as they're on television. Imagine a world where your greatest fears become reality. It tastes like death. Welcome to Fear Factor. You will each have to transfer these disgusting food items by mouth. The big prize money might be an incentive, but it's not the only one. There are a whole lot of people who want to be famous, and no better way to do that than to get onto television and to do crazy things like eating maggots. The three contestants that transfer the most weight in maggots will move on to the next round. Oh. Look, I can understand people consuming bull's testicles for prize money, but the horrible part is that three out of the four do that and go home with nothing. We've got... Witchetty girl. No way! Oh, it gives me goosebumps already. Oh. 
no amount of money would get me to do that. Look, my attitude is if you're going to appear on television, at least maintain your dignity. Climbing his way up to number five is the upwardly mobile Alain Robert, a man with his head in the clouds. Take me to the clouds above, take me to the clouds above, take me to the clouds above. Perhaps I am uh, the real Spider-Man, and uh, because uh, I don't use uh, safety equipment, no web, nothing. Yes, with a tight grip on the building, but a lot looser grip on reality. Robert has climbed some of the world's tallest structures without using safety ropes. Clearly, Spider-Man is a big thing for him. But, you know, you don't see me popping on a bit of a Wonder Woman outfit, getting him an invisible plane. Do you reckon he has any fear of failure whatsoever? No, he's, he's completely mad. Because if he just for one moment lost concentration, just for one split second, he falls a long way, and he's not wearing anything. He's in a leotard. Woo! 508 meters, Woo! the tallest building in the world, and Alan Woo! Roberts has climbed to the top. You know, I think we'd be a very boring, homogenized species if, if there were not the ones who leapt up out of the pack and said, hey, look at me. <laughs> this is my special skill. <laughs> Robert's heightened love for life has the authorities climbing the walls, but nothing will keep a good man down. A long arm of the law extended 150 metres above street level this morning when a Frenchman, who calls himself the Spider-Man, was arrested while climbing the centre point tower. Does he get thrown in jail? But he, they know. I mean, he'd climb out. Maybe he likes the handcuffs. I could tell you that uh, I share uh, the same kind of uh, philosophy as the, the Spider-Man. I'd like to see the real Spider-Man come up the side next to him. Yeah. Yeah. Need any help? I'm Spider-Man. Number four, it's every mother's worst nightmare. In fact, the words, do not try this at home, were invented for the Tokyo Shock Boys special brand of madness. Oh my goodness, these guys are insane. I hope it's not over here. Yeah. Two words, extremely disturbing. I think I'd actually vomit. I hate seeing that kind of stuff. These bizarre acts of self-mutilation are designed to make audiences squirm. The Japanese, every now and then they're a bit mad, aren't they? It is quite shocking, isn't it? Now I'm a mum, I just think, you cannot show these people to my children. I wish I was 15 years younger. I, I, think, I think I could have had a career at that. Originally street performers scaring passers-by out of their spare change, these punks of comedy now travel the world, shocking audiences with stunts like the hot wax facial. Amazing, the wax on the guy's face. I mean, I'm a woman, you know, we put wax everywhere, that's nothing. What is this guy on about? Why does he think that's so amazing? But I do wonder if they have trouble getting health insurance, you know. There's just something really weird about seeing these guys who can't speak a word of English, you know, pouring milk up their nose and then blowing it out their eyes. Oh, super milk trick! How do you figure out that you actually have a talent for snorting milk up your nose and kind of having it dribble out of your eye? He loves dry eyes. Hello. <laughs> It's an odd way to earn a living, isn't it? They're very well thought of in their psych ward, though, those boys. Good luck to them. Stupid and ridiculous. Unbelievable. After the break, we reveal our top three in tonight's countdown. Welcome back to 20 to 1 Mistakes, Madness and Mayhem as we reach our final three. 
and hopping nastily into third place is the biggest mistake ever made in this country. When the cane toad was introduced into Queensland in 1935 to control the native cane beetle, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It was supposed to eat the cane toad beetle, which lives at the top of the cane, but these guys hang out at the bottom. The introduction of a non-native species into an environment to try to kill off something else, and it just goes, boom, out of control, and it's still out of control. These eight toads, at one sitting, can produce 120,000 eggs. More than 100 million toads are now on the march across the country. They're already well established in Brisbane, and there are reports of colonies as far south as Sydney. The invasion is on, and I appeal to everybody to, wherever you see a toad, have no hesitation running over and killing the monster. I know I've made a clean kill, and the toad really goes off with a bang like a balloon going off. But the foreign toads do have friends as well. Love is in the air. These little girls had the cane toads as pets. They used to dress the toads up and tuck them into their little beds. These girls had names for them. They used to set up little tea parties. Well, I started feeding cage whiskets because they started robbing the cat's dish of whiskets. You can hear now a noise probably in the background, which is a toad which is probably mating. And that's what I like about them. One North Queensland council even proposed a monument honouring the cane toad. It is going to be a cane toad bust of around about a metre in height, and it was going to be a photographer's delight. Oh, surely this bastard can't be in his right frame of mind. But a giant cane toad? Obscene, scary, frightens small children, it frightens me. <laughs> See, the, the, the most disgusting looking thing, oh, your frog isn't a good looking unit anyway, but your cane toad's got like gnarly, knobbly bits stuck to it. I don't know why you'd lick one. Apparently, if you pick one up, lick it, or suck it back of its head, or eat one of its eyeballs, you can get quite a buzz. Apparently, some people, those crazy kids, get a little high off it. I don't recommend it. I, I believe it's actually poison, and you're not actually high, you are dying. Shimmying its way into number two, it's America's Tacoma Narrows Bridge, or as the locals called it, Galloping Gertie. That is some of the most amazing footage I've ever seen. It's so hard to believe it's not just bamboo and string roped together. Opened in July 1940, this otherwise elegant suspension bridge suffered terribly from wind. When you build a bridge, well, you don't have wind as part of the, the factor for it, you know? I mean, I understand if an earthquake's making a bridge wobble around, but if it's wind and if it's only 40 k's... Like every structure, it has a resonant frequency. You push it and you stand back and it'll sort of go, and come back. Unfortunately, the resonant frequency was close to the resonant pulses of wind. And soon with these little pushes, like little pushes on a swing, they built up into an enormous amplitude and the bridge was pushed way beyond its design constraints. She knows how to twist. The great main cable of the bridge over the Tacoma Narrows had tightened like a bowstring, whipping the vertical cables in the air. And I can only imagine the engineer that designed that bridge when he gets the phone call and he goes, the bridge is doing what? The 11,000 ton center span of steel and strong cable twisted and squirmed. I think it's quite extraordinary. The guy that walked out there with the car was taking photos. He's unbelievable. The photographer was Professor Frederick Burt Parkinson of the University of Washington. He barely escaped going down with the bridge. The world's third largest suspension bridge didn't keep us in suspense for long. Galloping Gertie let go with a sickening lurch only four months after her dedication. The original engineer who designed, do you reckon he got the gig on the second one? Wouldn't think so. And that brings us to tonight's number one. It's an act of madness and mayhem so famous that it's become a tourist attraction. 
In July each year, the Spanish Festival of San Fermín is kicked off with a wild stampede through the streets of Pamplona, all in the name of the town's patron. It must be a, a, a crazy adrenaline rush, like bang, it goes, you know, the bulls have been released. The whole point is to run the Inserio, which is right in front of the bull's horns with a newspaper, which is supposed to whack over the bull's head. Yeah, right. I think it was probably the most exhilarating adrenaline rush I've ever had. But there is nothing more terrifying than running down this tunnel into the ring. I ran with the bulls uh, with Getaway, and it was probably the dumbest thing I've ever done, but one of the most fun. How exciting is this? Adrenaline. My mouth has gone completely dry in a second. My heart is about to leap out of my chest. I was in a spot where it was really dangerous. I think 14 people had been killed. And I could just see all these feet flying in the air. They were just getting hit like 10-pin bowling pins. And I tried to get out of the way. And it swiped for me. I hit the ground laughing, got up, lost my shoe. One minute they were like 50 metres away, and then bangers on top of me. I just didn't realise how close I was, because if that had been my rib cage, goodbye. I love the fact they were white with a little bit of red. No, that does, that's not going to piss a bull off. Red? It's a tradition which dates back to the mid-1800s, but today many question its treatment of animals. I think, like most people, I cheer for the bulls. I think it's absolutely fantastic when the mob who have been teasing these animals for a couple of hours or so suddenly find themselves confronted with three and a half tons of animal with extremely long horns. The 29-year-old Tasmanian in the red T-shirt was hit repeatedly by the 500-kilogram animal. The bulls are coming that away. I'd start to run. <laughs> <We're a> taxi! <laughs> in most holiday destinations, it's not bulls chasing tourists through the streets. It's the shopkeepers. Well, that's all for tonight's menu of mistakes, madness and mayhem. Join us again next time for another 20 to 1. Good night. Next time on 20 to 1, we're counting down the 20 greatest songs of all time. That song is perfect. From raucous rock and roll. That's for me. I just, I look and, ah, oh, you know. To the smooth and soulful. Possibly the best pop song ever written. We've got music with a message. The stack of it. You know, what the song's about is, is incredibly important. And grooves to make you move. He kind of disembodied his body. He was all heart, he was all muscle. Da, la, la, la. He was a freak. I'm with you.